you're probably familiar with the image in front of you, even if you have no idea what it is or what it means. But a good chunk of you probably are aware that this is the cover of Neutral Milk Hotel's 1998 album, In the Aeroplane Over the Sea. This album, perhaps more so than any other in existence, is an album of internet legends for many reasons. The memes, the conspiracy theories, and the fact that a lot of people genuinely do consider this to be a great, if not perfect, album. So for today's episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a look at the story behind In the Airplane Over the Sea. This episode is sponsored by my own damn merch store. Buy something. Look pretty. It's a potato! One thing that I really love about memes is how it can take an old song and breathe new life into it. Or even expose it to a wider audience for the first time. A lot of the earliest memes that I remember were super focused on music. All your bass. Yatta. Numa Numa. And of course you had Rick Rolls, which were probably the first time that anything from 4chan went super, super mainstream. And don't get me started on the 17 volumes of YTM and D soundtracks. It's easy to say, oh, these songs are just meme songs, but when people start listening to them on their own time just because they want to hear the song, they cease being just memes. And I think one of the most interesting cases of the lines being blurred between music and meme is in the airplane over the sea. It's a case in which an already well-received album gets propelled to all new heights years later, mostly on the power of memes. And it also has an Anne Frank time travel conspiracy theory, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In the Airplane Over the Sea was released on February 10th, 1998. It was the second full-length studio album by Neutral Milk Hotel after their founding by Jeff Mangum in 1989. The album, characterized by its indie rock sound and its lo-fi production, was immediately a major critical success. It received extremely positive reviews from music critics and made a ton of best albums of the 90s lists. However, although it was quickly considered a classic of the genre and a massive cult hit, it was far, far away from becoming the commercial success it would be years later. Their label only expected to sell around 7,000 copies, which at the time wasn't really much at all. The album's popularity didn't really hit its stride until the mid to late 2000s, several years after the band had disbanded. This resurgence begins in September of 2005 with a reissue of the album. When it was re-released, it once again received a number of extremely positive reviews. In particular, Pitchfork.com, which at this point had established its reputation as a key taste-making publication, gave it a super rare perfect score. And probably more importantly, this re-release also happened to coincide with the increasing popularity of 4chan. In particular, 4chan's music board, Mew. Over the course of the next several years, In the Aeroplane Over the Sea would become a permanent staple of conversations on the board. In fact, to this day, it's probably still the album that's most associated with that board. And although this is partially due to the fact that people genuinely love this album, it's also partially due to the fact that its cover art is exploitable as fuck. This cover art, which is an edited version of an old postcard, features people swimming and a girl sitting on a dock with what appears to be a potato slice for a head. Or maybe it's a drum. Okay, it's probably a drum, but I prefer to think it's a potato, especially because I'm one of the people who initially really thought it was a potato. In fact, whether or not this is a drum or a potato or something completely else has been the source of a lot of debate, and even more memes. And for years, the posting of this album art as well as its derivatives would become so constant and ubiquitous that there is almost a kind of fatigue that would set in around it and people would kind of get annoyed that you posted it. And in 2011, after constant badgering from fans, Anthony Fantano, himself also a notable Mew meme, commented on the relationship between this album and the internet. I think this thing is a fantastic record, an amazingly abstract and beautiful record, but the fact that it's kind of become a series of jokes to be typed and repeated in all caps all over the internet is really depressing to me. 
and I think it destroys the feelings behind this record. And while he did make a good point here, I think there is another side to this. The memes and this album, they kind of have this symbiotic relationship where they keep feeding off of each other. It might start out as a meme for some people, but eventually that can change into someone genuinely liking the album. Honestly, that kind of describes my experience with the album. I mean, me personally, I was well aware of the memes before I had any idea if it even was an album. And it's generally not the kind of thing I would listen to. I mean, normally I hear an acoustic guitar in a song and I'm just like, skip. But with this one, it was just so overexposed, I guess, that my curiosity got the best of me and I wound up actually liking it. It's probably the only album like this that I've spent any appreciable amount of time with and that definitely would not have happened without the memes. But this story goes a bit deeper than anybody's opinion of the album or any of the memes that have to do with it. To go further, we have to look at the themes and the concepts behind the album's creation. And although there's a lot of different meanings that can be taken from the various songs, one particularly interesting aspect of it is its relationship to Anne Frank. In a 1997 interview with Puncture Magazine, Jeff Mangum explains, Yeah, I know it might sound kind of cheesy, Right before recording on Avery Island, I was walking around in Ruston waiting to go to Denver to record. I don't consider myself to be a very educated person, because I've spent a lot of my life in dreams. And I was walking around wondering, would everything make more sense to me if I knew the history of the world, or would I just lose my mind? I came to the conclusion I'd probably just lose my mind. Next day, I walked into a bookstore, and there was the diary of Anne Frank. I'd never given it any thought before. Then I spent two days reading it and completely flipped out. Spent about three days crying. It stuck with me for a long, long time. While I was reading the book, she was completely alive to me. I pretty much knew what was going to happen. But that's the thing. You love people because you know their story. You have sympathy for people even when they do stupid things because you know where they're coming from. You understand where they're at in their head. So here I am, as deep as you can go in someone's head, in some ways deeper than you can go with someone you know in the flesh. And then at the end, she gets disposed like a piece of trash. I would go to bed every night and have dreams about having a time machine, having the ability to move through time and space freely, and save Anne Frank. Do you think that's embarrassing? And although that time machine dream might just seem like a throwaway thing that Jeff said, it got much deeper in October of 2012. That's when a story that's often referred to as Mangumgate unfolded on Mew. The thread begins with the discovery of Jeff Mangum's high school yearbook. In the yearbook, there's a girl named Coraline Mangum. Any relation to Jeff? As the thread progresses, a user who is most likely aware of Jeff's interest in Anne Frank pointed out the similarities between Anne and Coraline. I can kinda see it, but a lot of people are seeing the resemblance and a theory starts to unfold that Jeff Mangum didn't just dream the time machine, he actually did do it. And then another user points out a group picture with Coraline where behind the kids, there's something that seems to be a Star of David. I don't really know about that one. I mean, say hypothetically, they really did have time traveling and Frank in class with them. I don't see a high school teacher going, hey, you know what? Let's throw a Star of David back there so people who see the picture, they, uh, they know the hints. Another wrinkle in the story appears when a user posts a picture of Jeff Mangum's wife, Astra Taylor. They point out that Astra also resembles Coraline and or Anne. So I guess he's got a type. And that's when the full scope of the theory comes together. Guys, Jeff Mangum saved her in some sort of time machine. Brought her to the late 1970s as his sister. They both graduate high school and under the fake name Coraline Mangum, once they graduate, they leave state and Anne has her name changed again to Astra Taylor. And some of the song lyrics were used as further evidence. From Ghost, she was born in a bottle rocket with wings that ring around the socket, obviously symbolizing Jeff's time machine. I know that she will live forever, she won't ever die. What the fuck, man? Then, one day in New York City, a girl fell from the sky. Jeff bringing Anne to our time period. It was also noted that Anne Frank's exact date of death was unknown and the remains weren't identified. 
And now, of course, there are some things that we need to consider with this theory. Say hypothetically, Jeff Mangum really did go all the way back in time to save Anne Frank, which I'm not so sure how a 90s indie rocker manages to infiltrate a heavily guarded German camp. But let's just say he pops in and out too fast for them to react. And then he brings her to his childhood to be his childhood friend, and then he goes back to 1997 and finishes the album. I would think that the introduction of a brand new childhood friend would alter the course of his life in such a way that he might not ever come to the point where he would create that album. And if he never gets to that point, he never has the reason to go back in time and save Anne Frank, creating some kind of a time paradox. You see, this is why John Teeter did the multiverse thing. But I think there might be some merit to this idea in the sense that perhaps Anne Frank's resemblance to his sister might have played a role in why this story affected him so much and caused him to go on to create one of indie rock's most iconic albums. Anyway, if you like this video, you might also like this video about whether or not Taylor Swift is secretly a 4chan user. Bye bye 